So growing with Jesus is where we are. It says where you are, uh, where we are. And what I'd like to talk about a little bit is uh, that I put down a key verse, which is Romans 12:2. This is the message translation. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into, with it, into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So this is about a transformation of a heart, a transformation of who we are growing with Jesus. So the question is, how can my heart be transformed? And if you read through the scriptures, you'll see many places where it speaks about the heart. And Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah talks about the fact that the heart is wicked and evil and who can know it. But the Lord looks upon the intent and thoughts of man. So that with God, it's not impossible, but with man, it is. Many of you have tried to change. I'm sure you've had the same experience as me that sometimes it works for a while and then something triggers you and you find you have an eruption and you're not as changed as you thought you were. No matter how long it was that you were looking good, all of a sudden you look in the mirror and the horns are kind of growing again. <clears throat> and uh, fortunately, I have a wife who can help me with that. I don't mean with the growing of the horns, but she's got the trimmer out and she just <laughs> trims it back for me. Maria. Yeah, I remember Maria, that's right. <laughs> So what or whom are we growing toward is really the question, right? We've been talking about growing with Jesus, and that's really the hint, right? But we haven't really spoke a little bit about where are we growing toward. And uh, Romans 12, 2 is telling us that in a sense. But I'm going to also look at Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And it says, until we all attain, in other words, we're growing and maturing, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and what I want to point out is the word we hear, and often you see you in the Bible. And because of our culture and how we kind of are self-centered, we think that you is the singular you. But if you go back to your English lessons, you know there was a plural you as well. Still spelled the same way, unless you were down south and you said y'all. That might be useful then. Sometimes y'all, and it's a good idea to remember that is you all. And that's really what most of the writing is about. It's not written to individuals. It's written to the church at Rome, the church at Philippi, the church in Colossae, the church in Ephesus, and I could go on. So when you read the Bible and you see a you, take it aboard. It's for you, but it's not for you separate and independent. It's just like when we pray the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, Our Father. I'm not just praying Our Father for me. You know, now, if you grew up in a family, sometimes you, uh, you say our, but you really meant me, like my brother and I, but I was really hoping the I would get most of whatever was coming, that's good, and that he would get most of that was coming that was not so good, because we usually got in trouble together. Unfortunately, I was the older one, so my mother had this idea that the older one's always responsible for whatever went wrong. No matter what my brother did, it was because I didn't lead him right, or I, I responded to his antagonizing ways. So, so <clears throat> until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, a mature person, gaining to the measure of Christ's full stature, practicing truth and love, we will all, in all things, grow up into Christ, who is the head. So that's what we're growing to, to be like Christ. Now, there was a while ago, there was a book, and we had a lot of people wearing braces, said, what would Jesus do? But that's really not a completely good question. It's a good question, and what would he do? But it really is, what would he do if he were you? See, we are to become like him, but the situations we have are different, possibly. But what would he would do if he were me? And I don't mean me as the fallen me, but me as who he wants me to be. If, he, if my heart was the same as his heart, or like his heart, how would I respond in a situation. So that's where we're growing to. We're growing to the point where we aren't controlling ourselves by mentally doing what's right, except for the moments when we have a lapse and we react to a stimuli that takes us out of self-control. We want to become people whose heart 
does the right thing without having to think about it. Because that's who we, who we have become. So it's uh, interesting when we think about our children, and I've got grandchildren, and <clears throat> their father, I think, probably had a more disciplinary father than my grandchildren have. But I'm not, I used to think maybe he needed to be a little tougher, and sometimes maybe he should have been, in the sense when they were real young and couldn't sort it out, and he was uh, reacting to his dad's overly stringent requirements. But uh, one of the times him and I were talking, we were talking about this, and he basically made the point, which I was very much in support of, that do we want them to do what's right because they're afraid of us, Dad, or do we want them to do what's right because they have now come to realize it's right, and that's who they're becoming? And obviously, and it's interesting because I had this talk with him when he was a teenager, because I had caught him doing something again that I had asked him not to do, like going to the mall after school with a bunch of crap rowdies and being part of the groups that were running around the malls back in those days. That was quite a few years ago. <coughs> and I caught him, he said, oh, Dad. I said, you know, son, you're old enough now to do what's right because you know it's right, and not because you're afraid Dad's going to catch you. Because you're at the point now you have to make man's decisions, and I can't be there to tell you what's right. I'm just hoping you're going to sort it out and get through it. And that's not what we want with our kids. We want them to grow up to be able to make good choices. And by the way, sometimes what we thought was right may not be as right as it was when we, when we thought it. I found a few times that maybe uh, his approach is a little better than mine was. Or that I had a, if I had a do-over, I would do it over differently. You know, people say I would live my life just like I lived it. Not me. I have got so many things I can repent of, and I wish I'd done differently. Of course, I didn't know the Lord for most of my early life, but it's just I'd have a whole bunch of do-overs and apologies and wish I hadn't done that or wish I had done something I should have done. So we want to grow. We want our, our friends and our loved ones to grow towards Christ-likeness where their heart leads them in the right direction without a checklist of what they should do and shouldn't do. And that's what the Lord wants. And that's what the rest of the message is talking about. At least I hope so. <clears throat> so throughout scripture, man's heart is recognized as the center of our being where our truest thoughts and intentions come from. Oh, I've got the bottom line. So becoming like our Lord is where we are growing towards. Now the next one. <clears throat> so Deuteronomy 6.5 is where we were told, love the Lord with your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Now in the New Testament it says with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul and all your strength. But basically, the heart, as it's put in the scripture, is really your thoughts and intentions and the very center of who you are. And it's where, as Jesus says when he's talking to the Pharisees in one place, and I have it here, Matthew 15, 17 to 20, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? They were complaining because he wasn't washing his hands ceremonially like they all did before they ate. And what he's saying is, hey, you know, that isn't what makes you unclean, spiritually unclean, eat, eat, not eating with the richly washed hands. What makes you unclean is what comes out of your mouth, which is indicative of what's in your heart. He said, because the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and they defile them. <clears throat> now, probably most of us have had an opportunity to wish we had something that we could have pulled back in and stuffed back down after it came out of our mouth in a moment of anger or a moment of frustration, or whatever. But as we have a heart that's transformed, as the Holy Spirit of God transforms our heart as we work with him, those should become less and less. Now, when I came out of the Navy, uh, for those who know what Navy folks look like, <clears throat> I was, uh, what was I? I was about 27 by then. Anyway, um, that was between 67 and 77, just to give you an eyeball. And it's the end of the Vietnam time and a couple years after that. And have you heard her swear like a sailor? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I wasn't a believer at the time. And that, that, that makes it any better. But uh, what happened is when I came to know the Lord, I would still slip on occasion. And it got less and less as time went on. But every time I did, I feel like somebody stabbed me with one of those cattle prods. You know, that electric cattle prod? It goes, zit! Because I'd like, oh, man, I did it again. But it just came out of my mouth. And then afterwards, I went, oh, man, I did it again. You know, so God changes you. But it doesn't just happen without your cooperation. Because he doesn't 
You know, God is very gracious. He wants to help us. He wants to work with us. But he isn't going to drive you to it. He's going to lead you to it, and you can either follow or choose not to. I really love the, the music this morning. I didn't pick any of it. Uh, obviously, the Spirit of God was working in the selection of music. He is able. It's just great news because he is able. But are we willing? Are we willing? And I don't mean willing to, to work in the sense that we can accomplish by work. God isn't interested in us working to get credit. But he isn't against us working as long as we recognize who does the the working prepares us to be changed by him. Think of it like playing the piano or playing a sport. You do drills to teach yourself how, you know, in the sport, you have to be able to do it when you need to do it without thinking of, well, our next step is this and the next step is that. By that time, you're killed. <clears throat> but in the piano, same thing. Why do you keep doing the scales? Why do you keep playing a piece? Get that muscle memory, right? But then, when your spirit is playing a song, you don't think about what the muscle memory has to do because it gets to do it. It goes very well with what Jeff was speaking on habits. I like to think about when he talked about the habits, one of the things that struck me about the science behind how our habits formed is that our body has a, now, once the habits form, you don't have all that brain activity going on. Well, you know, when you have all that brain activity going on, I don't know if any of you meditate or, or try to sit quietly before God. The whole point of sitting quietly before God, rather than just praying to him, is to be open to him, to listen to him. Doesn't mean you might hear his voice, but you might have a change or something come over you in the hours afterwards that was seated there during that quiet time. So when the muscle memory is trained and you have those quiet moments, the spirit can do things in there that you were too busy thinking about before when you're trying to do it yourself. I hope that makes sense to you. And we do the same thing with our children. When they're very little, we try to chain them, to protect them, like don't touch the stove. Of course, most of them need one or two mistakes before they understand that hot really is <laughs> and what that means. But at least we hurt, hopefully save them from really bad things. So that's what God's doing with us, and, and we have to participate. So we need our hearts to be transformed, to be like Jesus' heart. Then our actions will be good without our thoughts needing to hide them or stop. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show a four-minute clip on the Holy Spirit. And the reason being is because the next thing is we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And I think it's useful for us to be reminded a little bit about him. So if we could roll that one. If you've ever heard the phrase... If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place. But then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you got to clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. <sighs> so you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, Ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's Ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's Spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's Spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's Ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophets saw it. 
While God's Ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes, and the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. The story is saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus, who saw him alive from the dead, said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's spirit. And so today, the spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. So I, I hope that uh, probably maybe know most of that, but I thought it was a very nice short way to be reminded, maybe useful with uh, other people that you know that want to know something about the spirit. Did you notice that nowhere in it is said that anybody deserved to have the Spirit? I don't know if you caught that because it wasn't said, because it isn't true. No one does need to be deserving. I mean, it is true that no one's deserving. But he comes upon and brings life to us. The reality, too, was if you uh, read about the early church and even the many centuries after that, the church is an active, vibrant, living reality because the Spirit is in amongst us and in us. And that's important. We are really, by the Spirit, one, of, one with each other. We're part of each other in a sense, as much or more so than your family bloodlines make you. Because those things are temporary, they pass away, but the God's Spirit is in, at forever, permanent. So those of us in Christ are one with another, in the same family, Knowing God's love, and one of the reasons we should love each other is because we are this permanent relationship. Just think how bad it would be if we get to the new creation and we hate each other. That wouldn't work, would it? Because we're going to be stuck with each other forever, you know? It's, it's hard enough spending the weekend with my brother. What am I going to do, you know? <laughs> Not really, but <laughs> it can be sometimes. He might say the same about me, by the way. So, so for, number four here, God the Holy Spirit has work in us to be open to his will and to be empowered for us to grow towards Christ likeness. That's Philippians 2.13. We saw that last week when Jeff spoke about habits. Again, over there. So I just want to put in it because that part is so important and we so often pass by it. He's at work in us both to stimulate us to desire to do his will and then to enable us to do it as we step out. So think about what that means. <clears throat> and I think this is where we sometimes uh, go astray in a sense of not, not being able to get there. We don't step out with the expectation he's going to enable us. We step out with our own expectation of trying to do what's right. Can you see the difference? It's kind of like if I swim to the side of the pool when I'm a kid and I reach up for my my dad or my dad's up there or my mom is reaching down for me and I don't reach up for them, they're not going to be able to grab my hand and pull me out of the pool, are they? I'm swimming there, get me out of the pool, get me out of the pool. And you're, you're, well, reach up, you know, so I can grab you. You know, it's not that me reaching up pulls me out of the pool, right? But I have to join in the work that's being done to get pulled out of the pool. 
kind of the same thing if you get the kids to jump to you in the pool. Probably most of them here are too big for that now. They might hurt you and they land. But, you know, sometimes it takes a while before they trust that you really will catch them. So you start off slow, but then you catch them, right? And then they start wanting to do it all the time until they wear you out. <laughs> At least that was my experience. So, so that's where God is with us. He needs us to join in what he's doing, but part of joining is expecting him to be part of how we're doing. We have the same thing when we have problems. I love that hymn, God is able. We get in a problem, and you think he's supposed to take us out of the problem. But the reality is, and this goes along with where do we grow? We grow where we are. The problems are part of the classroom assignment. The problems are where we get the chance to put it to work. And if we're struggling with it, we need to turn to him to bring us the rest of the way through it. Now, sometimes the rest of the way is not that the problem gets o- goes away. We just have to endure it. But he actually enables us to endure it. So often we endure it. We get to the other end, and we feel like God didn't help us. But maybe if he wasn't helping us, we wouldn't have got to the other end. We just... We're not very appreciative or recognizing. And uh, you know, I, I can think of myself. I didn't appreciate the, some of the things. Uh, my family broke up. Uh, I, w- I was like two when my dad did left. And he was a pretty vicious guy. And that's why we got uh, separated. And my mom was getting beat up by him. She lost three kids in various stages of pregnancy and delivery because of being beaten up. So she was pregnant with my brother, and he kicked her down the stairs. And my grandfather, her father, came and got us and took us away. But, uh, you know, y- you need to work with where you are. So I needed to work with my grandfather to grow and understand. And sometimes I didn't even understand how much he was doing to, for me until years later. And sometimes I was very unappreciative for whatever reasons besides immaturity. But um, the reality is that I look back, and even my mom as as tough as she had gotten with all the twisting of being abused and everything, I look back and I, I never really understood how hard her life had been that made her how she was. And after she came to know the Lord years and before I did, it began to change her, which was part of how I eventually opened myself up to receive the Lord because it used to be we could tolerate being with each other for maybe overnight. <laughs> and I was in the Navy and I would, <laughs> I'm coming home for a week and I would leave after two days and uh, you know, go to the nearest base and catch a flight to where they were going and just take a vacation wherever that was. So that's not real nice about me either, but it's just the point of we're like that sometimes. We need to learn to be grateful. And when we're grateful, we start seeing more of God at work. And the more we see him at work, the more we see him and appreciate him and grow in our love for him and our heart is transformed because we become more secure. It's like our children again. The more they're loved and cared for and nurtured and brought along, the more they trust you because they're not afraid they're going to get punished if they're in trouble. They're going to get helped. Now, sometimes help means tough love, and you have to help them with that. (laughs) But they need to understand that when it all comes to, you're not going to turn your back and just slap them aside, you know. So, so God will give us both the desire to do and the power, Philippians 2.13. This allows us to grow wherever we are. Now think about that. If we're growing on the inside, it's kind of like the other side of the coin is, if I'm going to leave to get rid of my problems, guess what follows me to wherever I show up if they're my problems? My problems go with me, and after I'm there a little while, they show up again. Pretty soon you start saying, hmm, the lowest common denominator for those who like math must be me, because these same problems keep showing up wherever I am. Now, when you're younger, you don't want to really admit that, so you're kind of slow to come around to it. But eventually, you know, you get hit in the head enough times, you really realize that maybe, maybe I need a duck. <laughs> so, so that's one to think about there. We, we are to grow where you are. That doesn't mean here at Freedom Life Center, although we hope so. But where God has you, no matter where he has you, and this is another aspect of it. Our society would like to say that religion, which is not about relationship with God, but just about the structure of doing things, is to keep on wherever you do it, Sundays, Saturdays, whatever your time is. And the rest of the week and at the job doesn't count. But in relationship with Christ, everywhere is spiritual. Everywhere is a spiritual opportunity. 
every challenge. You go read First Peter, and he's talking about, everybody likes to hear about, uh, be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. But if you read the passage before that, in the last half of the previous chapter and the rest of that chapter, it turns out that all the situations he's talking about are difficult things where you're a slave and your master's hard on you, or your husband and wife thing, all these things. And the hope that is in you is to be able to do these things with a good heart in a cheerful way, not necessarily a happy way, but a cheerful, joyful, so that people say, how can you go through all this that you're going through? What, what drives you? What enables you? And then you can talk about who it is that enables you, not what it is. Because the Holy Spirit is not a what. He's the third member of the Trinity. He's a person, just like the Father and the Son. And the three of them together are at work in you. So the Holy Spirit is essential to our growth and transformation. That's part of what I'm trying to get across here. So I have another YouTube, three minutes and 22 seconds worth. It's a little bit from the book of Acts. But the, the Spirit is very essential to the book of Acts. You might call it the Acts of Jesus or the Acts of the Spirit with Jesus. So we can try that one. One of the earliest accounts about Jesus of Nazareth, his life, death, and resurrection, was written by a man named Luke. We know it as the Gospel of Luke. But Luke continued the story in a second volume. Called the Book of Acts. And it's all about what Jesus continued to do after his resurrection. Acts begins with the disciples who are hanging out with Jesus, who's just come back to life, which is mind-blowing to imagine. And then for weeks, the risen Jesus kept teaching them about his upside-down kingdom, the new creation that he launched through his death and resurrection. This is exciting stuff, and the disciples are ready to go tell the world. But then Jesus tells them to wait and to stay in Jerusalem until they receive a new kind of power so they can be faithful witnesses to Jesus and his kingdom. Then he says that their mission is going to begin in Jerusalem, then move out to Judea and Samaria, and then from there out into the nations. It's like a road map for the whole book of Acts. Then the disciples saw Jesus enthroned as king of all creation. So the disciples wait, wondering when this power is going to come. And then comes the time of Pentecost. So this is an ancient Israelite festival it's during the early summer, and thousands and thousands of Jewish pilgrims would come back to Jerusalem from all over the world, all these different languages and cultures colliding in the city. And the disciples are together in a house, which is suddenly filled with rushing wind along with fire. Fire splinters off into tongues of fire hovering over people's heads. What's this all about? Yeah, so Luke is tapping into a repeated Old Testament theme. When God's presence showed up similarly at Mount Sinai, he made a covenant with Israel and gave them the Ten Commandments. Then later, when God's glory came in a pillar of fire, it filled the tabernacle when he came to live among them. But that was just one pillar of fire, not many. Exactly. Luke's making an important point here. This is God's personal temple presence, God's spirit that was foretold by Israel's prophets. And now it's come to take up residence in the new temple of Jesus' body, that is, his people. They've become little mobile temples where God now dwells. And they start to tell stories about Jesus, but they're speaking in languages that they didn't know before, yet all the visitors can understand them. What's this all about? Well, Peter gets up to explain that this is the fulfillment of Israel's hopes based on the scriptures. God's plan was always to use the unified family of Abraham to bring peace and justice to the world. But the tribes of Israel had been scattered because of the exile. Now here at Pentecost, representatives from all of the tribes come back together and they're introduced to their Messiah, the crucified and risen Jesus, so they can now become the restored people of Israel. And thousands of them start following the way of Jesus. Which brings us to Luke's tale of two temples. So you've got the temple that Herod built in Jerusalem, where Jesus' disciples worship like the rest of the Israelites. But now there's also Jesus' temple, which consists of people. This temple's meeting together in homes all over Jerusalem, and they were approaching life in a radical new way. Right, think about it. Many of these pilgrims aren't even from Jerusalem, so they formed these new families, and they're all depending on each other. Yeah, people would sell their stuff, provide for the poor among them. They ate their meals together. They said their daily prayers together. They were learning from the apostles what it meant to live as if Jesus is the true king. So they were growing with Jesus, right? Growing with Jesus. So I don't know if you caught it. 
if you haven't thought about it before, you may have missed it when he started talking about the two temples, about how this, the original fire on the mountain was one, and the fire over the tabernacle in the wilderness was one, and really when God, when they built David, the temple that Solomon built for David, the Shekinah glory of God fell upon that temple, but when that temple was destroyed during the exiles of Babylonia and Assyrian conquering, uh, when they rebuilt the temple, even during ne Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah's time, and then Herod expanded and glorified the temple in the sense of making it from man's standpoint a glorious, the presence of God was not there. They had all the sacrifice, they went all the rituals, but the mechanics were what they were going through. And Jesus came and he brought the Spirit. And then, after the resurrection, the Spirit came, and so the multiple tongues of fire were like the fire coming down on the temple, or on the tabernacle, but because each of us is part of the temple, they were separate tongues of fire, not just for speaking the languages that were needed there, but they would be more than that. It was, as he said in the video, that the presence of God was there. So the presence of God is here. I think we undervalue that. I think we under comprehend that. It's very, I mean, I think it's almost impossible to fully comprehend. But when we look at each other, we're looking at part of the temple. And together we are the temple. And I'm not just saying Freedom Life Central. I'm saying all Christians are part of the temple as the Spirit of God is in them. And, and if one of the reasons we need to love and respect each other is we are in the presence of God. And that's also why we need each other to adequately come to worship, to have our hearts transformed because we are here to help and encourage each other. Sometimes we have to nudge each other that maybe we're looking in the wrong direction, but we need to do it in love and not in condemnation. And this is part of our transforming our heart. Now, how long does it take before everything's done? Well, I'll just say that Paul in Philippians says, not that I have yet gotten there, but I'm still working, and I forget what is past, in other words, all the mistakes of the past, and all the things he thought he did right in the past that turned out to be not so good, or not so necessary, or not so valuable. But I press on for the calling of becoming more and more like Jesus. So it's a lifetime. Now think about this. If you're in Christ and the temple, and you're in God's presence in there, you've already started the future. You're living the future right now, and it's only going to get better as life goes on. And, and as the earlier video showed, God's Spirit turns the whole world into his kingdom. Now, his kingdom is always here because he can do what he wants. But he brings us along. He's not willing that any should perish, that but all would have the opportunity to be part of it. Yet he doesn't drive us into it. He leads us with the opportunities. So... The, the rebuilt second temple in Jerusalem did not have God's Spirit. I said that. The apostles in early church recognized the power and presence of the Holy Spirit as an indication that God was once more among his people and now in his people. That's uh, number eight there. So this indicated, and this is kind of where, as you read the New Testament, especially the epistles, and because the, the Gospels are more about while Jesus was walking, and the things he was teaching, although they are about kingdom future as well. But the epistles are written to members of the body, to church together in the various locations. And they're written to do just what have we need. Why do we look at them for what we should do? Why do we look at the epistles, the letters, for how we should recognize things? Because that's what they were written about. They were written to people that were having problems. They were growing, but they were making mistakes. They were going the wrong direction. They're being led astray by the Judaizers who wanted to get them back into following the law and not by the Spirit. And so there are instructions that have pertinent principles for us, and they honor God as we read them. So we in the temple, as the temple, this is not the temple, by the way, this is just the building, we need the information there that the Spirit can teach us through each other, through, as he works in and what, each other, what is the way towards Jesus and open us up to it. That makes sense to everybody? I mean, it's just like in the family, in our, you know, our families, we need each other to love each other. There's nothing worse than be ostracized from your family. Sometimes we ostracize the family from ourselves, and we always wish we had them together, but we can't get past that problem that causes us to get separated. We can't look past it. 
my brother and his oldest son haven't spoken for 15 years. He's married, he's got kids, they've hardly ever seen their grandkids. It's a real burden on my sister-in-law because she really would love to be with the grandchildren. Now they're getting older. And now that she's getting older, I mean. Now my their younger son, they're okay with that, and so she's enjoying those grandchildren, which are just really little now. So, but it's a matter on both sides. My brother and my, my nephew just won't. You know, it's like my brother says, well, I'm the, I'm the dad, he should apologize to me, then I'm glad to get back in Arkansas with him. I'm like, why don't you reach out first? Nope, he should come to me. All right, you know. So that's, I mean, that's just the way we get in the way of ourselves. It's just sad, it's heartbreaking. Anyway, uh, I hope that, and by the way, the uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16 passage talks about us being the temple. That's why I put the, the, the note on 1 Corinthians 3.16 on the very last point. So I hope you understand a few things about part of how we grow. I mean, let me just glue in the, the habits section to this. Pastor Jeff spoke for two different weeks about habits and how they're formed and how they stay with us and we don't even think about them anymore. If you were in those, and that's really important. I mentioned earlier in this message about how once we get in the habit, we, it opens us up if it's a good habit for the spirit to be working in us because we don't have to think about what we're doing. But if it's the wrong thing, we really need to think about what we're doing. As the habits uh, discussion so showed us, there are cues that trigger us to do stuff. And sometimes they're hard to understand. I mean, there are things that have happened when, when I was a boy. It's taken me years, decades, to understand why when somebody does a certain thing, it just fires me off. And I still screw up sometimes on that. But the more I get to understand it, the more I can begin to look for a change to the cue or a new habit to displace it. The more I follow the Lord, the more I'm with the Lord's people and change things, those old habits get masked over and a new habit takes their place. It's not that they're not still in there, they're just not strengthened anymore. I'm not reinforcing that habit, I'm building a new habit off a cue that might be similar, but maybe not the same, that starts to take place and displace that habit. And the spirit helps in all that. And it also, just think about this, if the spirit wasn't giving you the desire to change that old habit, why would you change it? Now, socially, sometimes you need to change a habit just because social, but the real reason to change it is ultimately because it's not pleasing to God. It doesn't, it doesn't move you in your growth in the right direction. And so that's, that's part of why take the habits, take the spirit. It, it, it doesn't, it's not like either or, it's they work together. And we're going to learn more in the next part of the series that Pastor Jeff is going to bring next week. So I, I hope you'll think about that. Um, I'm pretty sure the YouTube things I put here are right, but it's the Bible Project, and they have a lot of these little videos that are very good. Uh, they have some that are for younger children, but mostly it's for people, uh, you know, teenagers and above probably, I'd say, or it's junior high. Uh, I think they do a great job of taking it and making it really simple, but they get some big points across. And uh, the guy who does it is a professor on a, in a Christian university out there. He's also been a pastor in Portland, Oregon. Uh, so I hope the, God will bless the message to you, and if you will join me in prayer, I'll just give thanks. Father, we do thank you so much for all that you've provided for us, and we thank you, Lord, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, God in one. We just ask that we would be tender and receptive and eager to fall in line with your leading and direction by your Spirit. You would enable us to love one another, but especially to love you more, and as we love you more, we will love one another. Be with us today. Let our day be one of joy and peace and give us wisdom as we go out into the workforce the week ahead that we would carry you with us, know that your presence is there and be receptive to your guidance. We ask it all now to your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a great day.